Right. <clears throat> I'm going to change gears here a little bit because when you think about developing a cognitive disorder, how many of you, don't raise your hands, but how many of you have this in your family? How many years have you worried about it? You know, I have a, I have a sister-in-law whose mother died of early onset Alzheimer's. She was gone in her early 60s. And Marianne is worried about it, has been worried about it her whole life. And she will do puzzles and do everything she can to try to keep as much memory as she can. She, she shows more than usual concern when she sees something. She forgets something. She forgets that she said something. She can't find something. It just, you can feel it. And some of you can probably identify with that, especially if you have it in your family. Thankfully, it doesn't run in our family, but the experience that I had was watching my mother deal with my stepfather for about nine years. It wasn't too long after she, my, my father died young, my mother remarried after 11 years and had a few years, two or three years, before he got, he started to develop Alzheimer's. God bless her. I don't know if I could do it. And when we think about caregiving, and we'll talk about that in a minute, it's, it's tough stuff. So, depending on where you're coming from tonight, now I'm going to talk a little bit about what happens if you receive that diagnosis. What about, what about somebody you love? Getting a diagnosis of any form of cognitive disorder like that, what do we do? And I'm, I'm going to run through these things real quickly because there's far more information here than we can ever get through tonight, but I wanted to give you a little bits and pieces of things to think about. Anything I have to say tonight is not the end all and the be all of anything. It's just some ideas of what people face. Obviously as human beings, and Dr. Bennett talked about this, our reaction to a diagnosis is gonna be anywhere from here to here. There are people that are gonna simply live in denial. Okay, fine, you say that I have that, but life will go on as usual and I'm really not gonna do anything different. We can live in active denial. We can all also be, as she said, relieved. It might be a relief for you. It might be a relief for the person you're caring about. You might be angry. You might be angry at yourself, thinking, what could I have done to maybe do things better, to preserve my health a little better than I did? Um, so those are just some of the various things that people can feel and think and experience. One of the things that I wanted to bring out that I think is significant, and I'm gonna to refer to my notes here and there, so bear with me, just because I can't remember all of this. <laughs> and I know that I have age-related memory loss. Uh, one of the things I want you to think about is that depression is very commonly correlated with some form of dementia or uh, memory loss or cognitive disorder. Uh, quite often that's gonna happen. But depression is not a natural progression of aging. We think, well, that's kind of a natural progression. No, it isn't. Depression isn't a natural progression of anything. So that we really need to spend some time thinking about that. There are nearly 45 million people that are 65 years of age and over. And about 2 million of them are diagnosed with a depressive disorder. That's a lot of people. Another 5 million are diagnosed with what's called a sub-syndromal depression, which means it doesn't meet the full criteria for a depressive disorder. It's depression light. That's seven million people over the age of 65 that are dealing with depression. And when dementia is a part of that, and yeah, I'm still using that word. I know I shouldn't, but I'm still going to, because we all understand that. Um, then there is a higher risk for suicide. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. And they figure that with age 65 and older, that age group accounts for about 18% of the suicide deaths. And it can be related to changes in life that we don't want and we don't want to live with. I, I have a friend who is not a close friend, is a, is a close friend of a close friend of mine whose husband just killed himself because he said, nobody's gonna take care of me like this, and warned her and warned her and warned her that I'm not going to live with this until I die. This is not gonna happen. 
You are not going to be taking care of me in very uh, embarrassing ways. I'm not just going to die like that. And he didn't. And it's very sad, but it's also something that we have to keep in mind. Um, another thing that I'll mention right before I change this slide, which I already changed, is anxiety. Obviously, a diagnosis of some form of cognitive disorder can really ratchet up somebody's anxiety. Now, if you are already prone to, dement, to uh, depression or anxiety prior to that, and sometimes it runs in your family, sometimes you've dealt with that all your life, a diagnosis like this obviously can kick those symptoms up. And we've got to pay attention to both because there is treatment for both, especially in early stages of, of a cognitive disorder. It responds well to medication. It responds well to psychotherapy. And we really need to get people involved in that when they can. What's the practical impact of a diagnosis like that? Obviously, it affects our independence. It affects our decision making. And we have decisions to make and need to make them. You might need a power of attorney. You might need to get your affairs in order. We're used to that when we get some kind of a physical diagnosis that says, you don't have a lot of time. But with whatever time we have, we have to think about uh, what we need to do. A person's ability to make decisions for themselves, that's mental capacity. And when we start to see that go, we all have to be responsible about what we do. How does a diagnosis like that and the effects of that affect our, our definition of ourself, our sense of confidence, self-esteem, who am I? How, do I? how do I define myself? How will that change? Who will I be? And answering those identity questions are pretty important. Now, I'm just going to mention a few other things that are things that we often look for. Nothing new. We've heard of a lot of these things that can happen. Changes in communication. What are some of, the cha what are some of those changes that might occur when someone has a cognitive disorder? Obviously, how many of you, don't answer this, how many of you have word-finding problems? You just think, yeah, anybody in this room not have word-finding problems? And that can be very common, where you just can't come up with it. How frustrating is that? And then when it progresses, when you really think, wow, there are a lot of words I can't come up with. Uh, problems understanding the word, the meaning of words, so that in communication, I have a tendency to talk fast. And if I continue to talk fast with people who can't process that fast, it's blah, 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 blah. They can't really follow that because it's a brain dysfunction. And when we're dealing with them, whether it's family members or whoever, we have to be more patient. Um, trouble remembering the steps, and Dr. Bennett mentioned that. If we have a lot of things in a row, first I want you to do this, and then you need to do that, and will you do that? How many of those are we going to remember? Not as many. Problems blocking out those background noises so that it just sounds like too much stimulation. Sometimes things have to be simplified, or people can't take it. And obviously, one of the things that I was going to mention in the beginning is that all of this depends on the type of diagnosis that someone has and the stage that they're in. In the early stages, you're going to hardly know a difference. But in later stages, you're going to see some of these other behavior changes that are much harder to deal with. I worked the first seven years of my career, after I got my master's in clinical psych, as a nursing home social worker. There are people that are cut out for that and people that aren't. I loved it. I knew for one thing, I didn't know what to do with people's mental health. Even if I had six years of education, I thought, oh my, I can't go there because I still don't know what I'm doing. But I, under, I really greatly enjoyed working with older people, learned a lot from them, and watched how all this unfolds. And I said to myself, this is where I'm going to be someday, so live your life knowing that someday I'm going to be here doing some of the things that they are doing and watching some of those declines. And I th maybe we should all start our lives out like that and say, hey, here's where, here's where we'll be. How do we cope with some of those, those changes in communication skills that people have? Making simple things, and this is not rocket science, making eye contact, becoming aware of how loud are we speaking, can they hear us? Do they, need, do they have a hearing problem, as Dr. Bennett mentioned? Do they need to look at our lips? Do we need to slow it down? Do we get a sense from looking at their face that they're, con that they're comprehending what we're saying? 
or not? Are we losing them? Are they losing interest? Are they looking over here or over there? Uh, simple one-step instructions, allowing more time for them to respond because the brain is simply not working the way it used to. And it's hard to keep that in mind because many times we're working with family members and we know them to be this person and they are becoming this person. And it's hard to make that adjustment ourselves. As, as things progress, asking questions that can be answered with a simple yes or no or a head, head nod. Um, and using different words if they don't understand. What are some of the personality and behavior changes that you might see? Restlessness, agitation, irritability. Um, they get upset, worried, anxious about things, angry. Some people become physically and verbally aggressive. Many times, let's say for instance with Alzheimer's disease, we all pretty much know that as that progresses, it's very common for someone to become physically and verbally aggressive that never was before. They might use language that they didn't use before. Maybe that we all know that language, but we try not to use it. I have a vivid memory of working in the nursing home and there was, there was a, a, a wonderful old lady that was the saint of the church. And all she did in later stages was swear like a sailor. And it was devastating to the people that knew her. But it is a part of the deterioration of our brains. And I often say to myself, uh, what's coming? You know, we all think about that. Um, oh, I went back too far. People become suspicious. Where did you, you know, if they can't find something, did you take it? Where did you put it? That's hard to take because it's part of the confusion. Um, they pace, they wander. Yeah, maybe they need a Fitbit because we might try to interrupt those patterns, but it is dissipating energy that they might need to dissipate. So let them wander. We just don't want them to get hurt. What do you do if you are trying to keep somebody at home and they are what they call eloping? They're wandering, they're leaving. And there are all kinds of devices that we can buy today. We live in a great age of being able to do things, fancy things with locks for safety and alarms, et cetera, that you can, if, if you are working to keep somebody at home, there are innumerable gadgets and ideas that are out there that there's no way we can cover tonight that really help if you are facing those kinds of problems. And obviously any of us that face that, you get to the point where, you know what, they can't stay at home. When my mother was dealing with my stepfather, she anticipated that aggression and that anger and that meanness, and it never happened. Now why for some it happens and others it doesn't, I don't know. But that helped her keep him at home. We have to decide who we are as people, and I'll talk about that when we talk about caregiving. Am I the kind of person that could have done that for nine years? I'm not sure I could. My mother was a first grade teacher. She had a lot of patience from day one. I don't think I have that much patience. So she did a wonderful job, especially when they get to the, early, the later stages and my stepfather couldn't remember how to eat. And she finally figured out that he was watching her. He wanted her to order the same thing at a restaurant so that he could watch how she ate that food and he would eat the same. And it took us a while to figure out that that's what was happening. Um, but there can be all kinds of unusual behaviors developing, unusual sexual behaviors, um, neglecting personal hygiene, that becomes a problem and it becomes a fight just to get someone to take a bath or a shower. It's hard being a caregiver. What are some of the other factors that can affect some of the behaviors that you might see that we have to keep in mind? Um, they might be sad, fearful, overwhelmed, stress about something else or about someone else, and they might not be able to say it. Confusion from a change in their routine. It's really hard to move people from one place to another when, when in the later stages. Are they hungry? Are they thirsty? Are they constipated? Are they on some kind of new medication? Dr. Bennett men mentioned lack of sleep changes everything. Poor eyesight, hearing, all those things affect how we behave, and they can be 
making behavior patterns worse when some of these things might be able to be looked at for intervention that might improve behavior. But when we're grasping at why is this person behaving in the ways that they are, those are just some other considerations. When we think about behavioral interventions, what can we do? How can we intervene? One of the things that I put up here that's important for us all to remember, because everything is going to be as specific as the person we're dealing with and needs to be as specific as that individual and what their needs are. So our goal for intervention is the optimal well-being of the person and the person who's offering the care. And understanding is one of the biggest things. How do we engage in an effort to understand and to offer that understanding to people? Sometimes we don't understand things in life because we don't try to understand things. Sometimes I have looked in my profession at things like trying to understand depression in someone. And I am amazed at the number of people who really don't try. You can pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. You know, what you feel like when you are truly clinically depressed is that an 18-wheeler has run over you. And someone is standing over you saying, get up. You can get up. Come on. And there is much more to it than that. And when we think about something like this, trying to understand those behaviors, is what are some of the strengths that these people have? How do we maximize those strengths? Who is the person that I'm dealing with? Who are they now? How can I work to understand both them and what's happening to them? Obviously, we talked about interventions need to be individualized for that person. What do they enjoy doing? What don't they? Um, being creative, being flexible. Now, all of this requires of, of a caregiver the ability to be creative and flexible. And how can you do that when you are living on your last ounce of energy? You're living on your last nerve. You're not sleeping yourself. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, keeping things simple, keeping daily routines. Um, if you're frustrated or you're angry yourself, how do, we, how do we interrupt that ourselves and maybe take a break? Using distractions, and I'll talk about music in a minute. In a minute. People, it's like dealing with children sometimes of changing the subject trying to lure their thoughts into some other arena where they're less agitated. Asking for their help with things, asking them to complete simple tasks, sometimes sorting socks over and over. You or I might think of that as that's pretty undignified. But if they are happy doing that and they feel like they're contributing something, is that really undignified? I don't think so. If they sort buttons into colors and they think that you're, they're doing you a favor, I personally don't think that's undignified. It might feel that way to, to you or I. But if it calms them or soothes them, it's really not. And using humor, I'll talk about that in a minute. Agitation and restlessness, that can, that can be related to a chemical imbalance in the brain that they really have no control over. It affects our processing and our perception. We can all get a little crazy. Don't we all have times when it's really, we don't take things well, or we take things too personally, or we really are looking at things in distorted ways, and we're working on a full brain. And then if we are watching the deterioration of our brain, it affects how we see things, how we perceive things, what I think of you, what I think you're trying to say to me, what I think you're trying to do, and people can become paranoid. I put this question in here, what's the capital of Nicaragua? Because when I'm not understanding things, and I'm not comprehending and perceiving, and then what I hear you saying is, what's the capital of Nicaragua? What's the capital of Nicaragua? What day is it? Who's the president? I had to look it up. The capital of Nicaragua is Managua, but I didn't know that. And I think it becomes irritating and agitating to people when we're asking them things that they no longer know. So we've got to figure out. I know that this is how old I am. We used to do reality therapy in the nursing home. They don't do that anymore. It doesn't matter if it's Monday, it really doesn't. So we're not going over and over with people that today is Monday, depending on the stage. 
um, looking for identifiable triggers if there is agitation and restlessness. Ask less and offer more. Sometimes we talk too much. We need to help and simply offer things without chatting about it. Um, because an upset person is, what, what are they going to do? They're going to struggle to respond to us. And we've got to keep those questions short and succinct and maybe not at all. Speak calmly. Don't engage in discussion. Don't challenge beliefs or ideas. It's not worth it. Don't argue. Those are things that we're all tempted to do because we're looking at that person as we used to know them, and they're not anymore. I put in here that a rocking chair is good with an agitated and upset person. I think it's good for us, isn't it? Anybody have a rocking chair? Mm -hmm. I do. And it's good for reducing that stress and tension and agitation. And it's also good for pre prevention. Sundowning. Many of you have heard of that. And that is where that level of agitation and anxiety and restlessness increases in the later afternoon, evening. And that's pretty common. 20 things not to say or do with a person with dementia. Um, and I put that up there, and I apologize. There's no way that we have time to go through that. But it's probably real difficult to read on your handout, and I should have made a separate handout and forgot to do that. But it's just reminders to all of us of things to think about. Um, don't talk about me to someone else in front of me. Just little practical things that we forget that this is a person that we're dealing with. None of us like that. Don't call me honey, love, or any other, anything other than my preferred name. We don't want to start treating people like children. We often think of that, of this is the way we came in, is this the way we're going to go out? But we need to be careful that we deal with people with respect and as much dignity as we can possibly offer them. Now we're going to talk about how, a little bit about how to prevent. How do we guard against some form of dementia? And there are all kinds of things up here we're going to talk about. And some of them are obviously social engagement. It is cognitively healthy for us to be socially engaged. When people withdraw and they lose their social contact, it's not good for our brains. It's not good for our general health. We need cognitive stimulation of all kinds, reading, puzzles, crosswords. Education, you might want to take a class. Tips to assist with wanna... memory use, and we've got this in the handout too, of focusing attention, um, reducing stress. Stress is hard on all of us, and we talked about that. Consistent sleep patterns. What about the environment? How is the home set up? Are there notes? Are there calendars? Sometimes people will laminate things and put them on the wall. I know with my aunt and uncle who are 93 and 94, they're in assisted living now, but only in the last year. And they had to put up little signs about how to use the thermostat, reminders about who's going to call when, and bigger numbers. And that kind of stuff is on there just for of exercises. Memory. We talked about that, crossword puzzles, jigsaw, Sudoku puzzles, um, and little tricks of how many, I have to tell you, my passwords are very similar. They shouldn't be. They tell us all that. But if it's not some form of my password, I'm not sure what it is. So usually within the number of tries that you have, I can figure out what I've picked. And that is because for my entire life, I have had a problem with short-term memory. I use more eidetic imagery. I can picture things, and then I can tell you what it is. But I've done that all my life. When it came to... Uh, completion on tests where you had to come up with a word, that's been trouble for me my whole life. So I have to find other forms of memory. And some of that is some of those reminders that we have to, that we have to use some of us all our life. Music. I want to talk about this just for a minute. Music boosts brain activity. So if you're not somebody who generally likes music, hopefully you are. We'll talk for a minute about that because these are some of the things that they found when it comes to music. It helps folks with a memory disturbance recall memories and emotions, even in the most advanced stages of a memory decline. Musical aptitude and appreciation are two of the last remaining abilities in dementia patients. Number three, it can bring emotional and physical closeness. 
Dancing can lead to hugs and kisses and touching, even with people who are not really necessarily wanting that. Singing is engaging. Singing activates the left side of the brain and listening to music activates the right side of the brain. And the last one is music can shift mood, manage stress, and stimulate positive interactions. In a lot of ways, music requires little to no mental processing. It's just easy. And for a lot of people, it's soothing. As a result of music playing such a big role, the Alzheimer's Association has devoted an entire uh, web page to this because of its importance. And I have a handout for you after that about this. How many of you saw this special, uh, the documentary on Glenn Campbell? Anybody see that? If you haven't, I put it in there for a purpose because if you can look that up and watch it, it was excellent. He's 80 years old now. He was diagnosed with Alzheimer's in 2011. He is in the last stages now. But one of the things that his wife said was he will still um, sing and play an air guitar. He doesn't play the guitar, but he pretends he's playing the guitar. And what they showed on the documentary was that he completed 100, after he was diagnosed and was in more than the early stage, he completed 151 concerts over a year and a half. And it was known at the time that he had Alzheimer's. And they show you in there that sometimes he couldn't always remember the words and could be triggered to remember those words. But it was one of the last things to go for him. And it's amazing to watch, so I recommend that. And that's the name of his last recorded song that he recorded in 2013 that's worth listening to. I'll be me. Let's talk a little bit about nutrition and brain food. A diet that is rich in antioxidants, phytochemicals, B vitamins, and omega-3 fatty acids. And that's why I put those pictures up there. It's like, well, I could pick a few of those things out that I could eat. Uh, fruits, vegetables, this is healthy eating, whole grains, fish, taking in more of those things, that's brain food, and also at the same time simultaneously lowering the amount of uh, processed meat that we eat or sweets, alcohol, smoking, things like that. We lower those things, we add those things, um, and it protects cognitive health. Let's talk for a minute about caregivers. There are an estimated 44 million people over the age of 18 who are in the role of being a caregiver for somebody with a cognitive disorder. 40 to 70% of those people are evidencing symptoms of depression. And one quarter of those qual or cl qualify as being clinically depressed. It's a serious depression. Caregiving is difficult. It just comes with the territory. It's a hard job. Anxiety is also something that is, is pretty high. They, because of the stress that people face, it decreases our immunity. It has a long-standing, difficult, long-standing um, stressful effect on every system in our body. And as caregivers, we have to be careful of how much we take. There, many times with caregivers, there's obviously an increased financial and workplace demand. You, a lot of people have to quit their jobs. And when they quit their jobs, they lose their insurance. Then they have to buy insurance. And so in an effort to try to keep people at home, it is, we are creating other problems. Um, one third of caregivers are in poor health themselves. So that's something to think about. Um, and then when we think about numbers, let's look at numbers. Over 5 million Americans have Alzheimer's. 7 million by 2025, and that will triple by 2050. So we're gonna have a lot of caregivers. They figure that at, at the present time, and I know that this is just a, a statistic, but approximately $306 billion are saved by, of healthcare dollars are saved by people doing caregiving themselves. So that's a significant thing. 
when we think about caregivers, what do we have to keep in mind? We've got to know our limits. What are my personal limits? I have talked to people who are natural born caregivers. They couldn't think of doing anything else. And I have talked to people for whom caregiving is very difficult. They don't like it. Their personality is not set up for it. They have trouble hanging in there. They want to do it for short periods of time, but sometimes they're the only person in that position. How many people get into that position and they have siblings who don't do anything? Then what do you do? And so you are over-functioning while other people are under-functioning. That's tough to do. Don't compare yourself to anybody else. Do the job that you can do. Express your own thoughts and feelings. If you're in a caregiving role, we have to be able to talk to somebody. You need support yourself. Just like that silly illustration of on an airline, put the oxygen on yourself first or you're not gonna be able to help your child. And the same thing is true. We have to engage in some self-care. Um, involving family and friends. To, when I say talk to the natives, what I mean by that is who are, the, who are the other people that are caregivers? It is very beneficial to a lot of people to um, participate in support groups, so, caregiver support groups, in order to be able to understand what am I facing, what are you facing, how can we help each other, and all the practical help that is uh, offered. Asking for help is important. Focusing on the good things, focusing on the good memories, trying to be positive, and taking breaks. Just some simple um, things to think about. And I'm going to end with this, because one of my favorite things in life is humor. I know that, you know, for any of us who do, who have occupations that involve human stress and human trauma and human suffering, I could not have done that all these years and been involved in people's lives on that level if I didn't have some sense of humor. Now, there are days when it doesn't function very well for me, and there are days when it does. But I depend heavily on humor for survival, and I think it's good for all of us. Even with people who have a cognitive disorder, as long as they can understand our humor, and it's not too complex, and they don't think we're laughing at them, or we're trying to make jokes or make things sound funny, and they're really not getting it, that's not useful. But as long as someone who is older can still take that in and enjoy it, it's good for them and it's good for us. Um, you can introduce humor gradually, but it is very healthy for both. Uh, they did a smile study in Australia, and they set out to find if humor could improve the lives of people with living with dementia. And for three years, they got 400 people who had dementia to giggle. And what they found out was that there was a at least a 20% reduction in anxiety and agitation among those who giggled. And we might think that's simple, but why do we stop as human beings? Why do we stop doing that? And it, reintroducing that is healthy. Um, interestingly enough, the giggling did as much for people as taking some kind of anti-anxiety medication. So do we want medication or do we want humor? I have included in the handouts a, a little handout that we use on the 23 benefits of humor. And even when we're dealing with things that are as serious as the diagnosis of a cognitive disorder, trying to keep our perspective involves humor, it involves our social support network, it involves being human beings together and trying to support each other as we are going through this and as we are trying to help someone else through it. It is a, obviously a taxing thing, but for any of us who have ever been in the role of caregiver, is it something that you would want to do? Typically, yes. Is it hard? Yes, it is. Does it take a toll on us? Yes, it is. But we are making a difference in someone who has lived their life and now is facing a difficult disorder and a difficult diagnosis. And it is a privilege, I believe, for all of us to be in a supportive role of people going through that. Any questions? I have a question. Sure. 
Does well, that well, I, I can't really speak to that exactly, but we often ask people how much caffeine they're consuming because it can increase anxiety and agitation. Dr. Bennett. Westbury does. Yes, do they? Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, we appreciate you coming this evening. Were you going to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to add that there are some handouts up, up there, uh, one of which is – oh, excuse me. I wanted to give you a, just one handout by the Alzheimer's Association uh, for caregivers, tips and tools, because there are any number of these that are out there on different topics. And they're very well done, and they're very informative. So this is only one. Um, diagnosed with dementia, now what? And it's informative, but there are a number of other things that you can Google and get real useful, useful information. Okay, well, thank you for coming.